Yeah, so. Because I'm on Facebook because it's it's using edge, that's the problem. Okay, I think I am now live. I can hardly see anything. Just allow it, cancel, okay. Um, Somebody is there watching. I guess I'll do a little sound check. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got it off of the Zoom call. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll be able to hear on the Facebook. And then I need to mute my Facebook so that oh <laughs> no we're on table okay so not only do I have to mute myself, I think I also have to make sure the volume on my computer is off. So that, because if the volume is not on, it's on, we will be, it's sharing. Should I close the Facebook page? Because I don't want to, okay. I don't have to. Okay, that's fine. I know three people have joined. Um, okay. So, okay, I think the volume on the Facebook is off. Okay, I just don't want to hear myself on Facebook. Okay, all right, we are ready. Even early. So what I'll do is once I'm done talking, not only will I mute myself, I will turn off my volume. And that way it will be all you and you just, we'll, 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 we'll make it work. Yeah. This is this is Governor Lee's making <laughs> executive order. Oh, I also need to record it, so I'm not recording yet. Let me get it to the recording as soon as we do. You don't hear me? Can you hear now? It's working. So to okay. All right, we have one minute, then I'm gonna get it to start recording. How oh, am I recording it? It's on Facebook Live. It's recorded in Facebook Live, right? Okay. It's recorded on Facebook Live. I don't need to record it. Okay. All right. Bob is like, I'm ready. Just get yourself together, woman. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Oh, but then I say I hear you. It's three. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Councilmember Lizofa Swara. Thank you for joining me uh, for this year's first budget conversation. Uh, I'm glad that we're joined this afternoon by Councilmember Bob Mendes who is the expert on all things budget. And uh, Councilmember Mendes will be able to dive in and dissect that 700 and something pages of number for all of us. And so first I wanted to thank you for being here. Thank and I wanted to say, to say uh, happy, happy anniversary, anniversary to, to you and your wife. wife. 
Thanks. Uh, we had our 27th wedding anniversary yesterday, so uh, halfway to 54. You, you're still about three years behind me, so, so but uh, let's, let's keep, keep going. going. Many, many more. more. Yes. So, so I don't take a lot of time. I don't want to take a lot of time because I know a lot of people are interested in this budget and they really wanted to hear what you have to say. So at this point, I'm just going to turn it over to you. I want you to take us through it. If you would include where can people find the budget and then just go into whatever you think everyone would like to know about this budget based on your expertise. And you have about 25 to 30 minutes. After that, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, for those of you watching live on Facebook, uh, please put your question in the chat. So when the time comes, we will make sure that we address all of them. But for now, uh, it's a lot of data. It's a lot of information. So I want you to just listen uh, and then think of your question uh, as we go into it. So thank you, Council Member, and I'll turn it over to you. Um, thanks very much. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. I, it's sort of a big buildup. Hopefully I can live up to it. Um, so we're, we're going to be talking today about what's in the budget and, and not really a lot of policy conversation about what should be or what could be. You know, the starting point is just what what is in it um, so we can know how to react to that. Um, and and so the, the most important starting point is that a, an annual budget doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, there are ground rules for how the budget works. You need to know where we've been and where we're going, and you need that as context. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just talking about some of the important ground rules that I know those of us in the council get used to. Um, that's just the way the world works, um, but, but people outside the council um, don't necessarily um, uh, have it, don't live it as much as we do day to day, month to month. So um, a couple of significant ground rules of the universe that we can't do anything about. Um, one is that the you know, budgets are revenues and expenses. And on the revenue side, the council has almost nothing to do with almost all the revenue projections. By charter, the finance director decides how much money there is to spend. And we can't tell him that we don't like his assumptions or we should assume less or more sales tax or less or more hotel tax. The only thing we get to do on the revenue side in the council is change the tax rate, which we did last year for the first time, I think in, in eight years or so um, before any of us were in the council. Um, so, on the, so on that revenue side, we don't really have a job in the council other than um, uh, what the tax rate is. Now, this isn't unusual, like at the federal government, Congress doesn't decide what the revenue is. The, um, the, there's a, there's a nonpartisan office um, of budget management that decides how much revenue there is to spend. So it's not unusual that, that we don't get to politicize how much money we think is going to come in. We just set a tax rate and that's it. Um, secondly, um, it's very easy to lose track of um, people call Nashville a strong mayor form of government. And what does that mean? The main thing it means is the mayor um, is in control of more of the budget process really than the council is. Um, and, and the way, the reason that is, is because, uh, you know, in baseball, there's the tie goes to the runner. On budgeting, the tie goes to the mayor. The mayor proposes a budget by May 1st, and then the council either passes its own budget by June 30th, or when you get to the end of June, the mayor's budget automatically goes into effect. And practically speaking, historically that's meant that almost everything the mayor ever proposes goes into effect. And just to, just to put some numbers on that, setting aside last year where the council um, was aggress more aggressive, much more aggressive than it had ever been in changing the mayor's budget, the, the maximum change to a budget that the city council typically did was about a million or two million dollars worth of spending. And when you think about um, a two billion dollar budget before last year, if the most the council ever changed budget was maybe two million dollars, that's literally a fraction of a percent that the council ever changed it. Last year, the council changed the budget by about twenty five million dollars, um, which is all of one percent of the total budget. So. It was a maybe an order of magnitude more change last year than we'd ever done before in the council, and it, it equated to one percent of the budget. Yeah. So we know going in that statistically, 
probably 99 point something percent of what the mayor proposed is going to go into effect. And even to get that 1% change last year, we had to change the tax rate, which I don't think we have an appetite for this year. Um, so in addition to knowing those ground rules, um, the what you mentioned before is people need information. And the two things to Google to get to information, you can Google Metro Finance Citizens Budget. And the finance department has nearly unlimited information about this year and prior year's budgets. And then you can also go to the Metro Council website. There's, you can Google Metro Council resources and you'll quickly see like the first link is about the 2022 budget process and all the information that's available to council members, that's the same portal that we use. So you'd have the same information we have. So the starting point, the ground rules and the information. Now, it, uh, the next background thing is where we've been and where we've been go, where we're going to be going. And where we've been is that there's been a horrible cash crunch um, for several years. It, it was it was multiple years in the making. And coming into COVID, literally the city had the worst savings of the 25 largest cities in America, a fraction of what the average savings was. Part of that's a self-inflicted um, wound because for some reason we politicized property tax rate and we did it uh, one property tax rate in about 15 years. Thank God we finally fixed or got on the road to fixing that last year. And then of course COVID um, uh, took, a, took a bite. So where we've been is for multiple years before last year, there was a long-term squeezing of constitu squeezing constituents on services and employees on pay. And just the way it took many years to get to that place, it's probably going to take a few years to um, get away from it. And so when we look forward to where we're going, um, the budget that we passed a year ago stabilized the dangerous um, lack of uh, resources for the city. And now we need to move from stabilizing to making it sustainable in years going forward. That should be the main object of this budget is to um, consolidate our wins for getting stable and move forward to sustainability. Again, it'll be a multi-year project to get there. Um, we need to, we, it, it, it's not too early to start looking forward to when we're going to get on a good cycle of making sure the city stays ahead of expenses and ahead of investing in employees rather than being behind like we have been for so many years. All right, so with those background things and the context, how do I view the current budget? Um, we'll do some basics uh, first, the, the, the broad strokes of it, and then get into some detailed um, expenses. The basics are um, the tax rate that the mayor proposed is $3.28. Um, and you know, by all alone, that doesn't mean anything. What it means for most people is that um, even after the reappraisal, your property taxes are probably going to either go up a little or down a little, not because the council or the mayor changed the tax rate, just from the reappraisal process. And if you want to know about that, you can go to the um, property assessor's website and learn more, or I've got a, a blog post at MendezForNashville.com. Um, it's the, um, one of my two most recent blog posts has a link to a video that describes the assessment process. But for most people, your property tax will be pretty much the same as last year. Um, the total amount of spending in this year's budget is $2.65 billion. Mm -hmm. So 2 billion, 650 million. That's up 7.3% from last year. Very importantly, that savings that was worst in America for big cities um, heading into COVID has stabilized. Um, and the current amount that we've got in fund balance is um, projected for the end for June 30 this year to be 314 million. That sounds a lot, like a lot, but again, on a $2.6 billion budget, that's below what experts recommend. Um, the um, Government Finance Offers Association, which is a national association of best practices for government finance, they according to their recommendation, we would have about $400 million in fund balance or savings. Um, and, and this budget proposed by the mayor says 314 and keep it at 314. That's not moving as forward as much as I would like on uh, sustainability, but it's a heck of a lot better than the way below 100 million that we were a year ago. Um, debt service has been a concern for Metro for a while now. Um, since I got elected first in 2015, the amount the city pays for debt keeps going up. Um, this year, 
um, the percent that we pay out of the budget for debt will actually go down. I think about this like your credit cards. You know, if, if you're making more money in your family and you're paying a higher percentage for credit cards, you've got a problem. Um, you know, something's wrong there. If you make more money, you'd like to see the amount you spend on your credit cards to go down as a percentage, not up. And for the first year since I've been in office in 2015, this budget um, starts bringing that down. We're still in a safe range, according to what the GFOA, uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, recommends. They, they like to see between 8% and 15% of your budget go to debt. We're going to be at 13.6% for this year. Um, the other, the two last big picture things in the budget, um, Mayor Briley um, was propping up the budget because he didn't want to do a rate increase by swiping money from the Convention Center Authority, swiping, uh, asking them to agree to voluntarily give um, in a very aggressive fashion. Um, and, and because COVID has hit the Convention Center Authority pretty hard, mm -hmm. they're not really in a position to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's a $35 million chunk of money that the Convention Center um, uh, contributed to the budget a year ago when we were still in rough shape and still going through COVID. They can't really do that this year. And so the $35 million worth of revenue from the Convention Center Authority isn't in this budget. Mm -hmm. I personally think that um, once the convention center gets up and going again, there's something they can contribute. I don't think it should be 35. I don't think that's sustainable for them. And then the other thing to know about this budget is um, as proposed by the mayor, it doesn't have any process laid out for how we spend the, the giant pile of mm -hmm. federal relief dollars that we've got coming. For comparison, last year under the Federal CARES Act passed maybe 14 months ago, the city got $121 million that it had to spend by um, New Year's um, a few months ago at the end of 2020. We were not allowed to use that for our operating budget. We had to use it for things to get through COVID. And we successfully did that. But we, the council put in the budget last year a process, a public meeting, transparent, diverse group of folks to make recommendations how to spend that $121 million. I believe, and I think most of the council will believe that we should have a similar federal, trans, not federal, uh, transparent, diverse public meeting process to spend the next round of federal money that we're gonna get. Um, we're supposed to get $267 million spread out over two years. Um, we haven't received it yet, and we'll have um, three or four years to spend it once we receive it. Um, but we can't use that for the operating budget. So everything we're talking about in this budget, we can't use it for that. But I believe that we should have a process set up in the budget that sets up a committee that's diverse, that meets publicly, that gathers information about how to spend that $267 million to get us through the rest of COVID. Um, so that, that I, I hope uh, uh, Budget and Finance Committee Chair Toons puts that in the budget. Um, now let's, let's move on to some um, more in the weeds details about the budget. And this, this is gonna be a lot of numbers. Um, uh, all of this is also on a blog post um, that I've got at mendezfornashville.com. Um, and if you, you look at um, the budget, especially if you're a council member watching, um, I recommend that you not only look at um, this year's budget proposal, but you pull out what we approved last year and put them side by side. Um, Cause the, the mayor's presentation and the summary from finance doesn't show all the changes um, year over year, and you can see all the changes better. Um, by and large, because we moved towards stable, a lot of departments got more money. Um, and, and those of us in Metro know that a lot of departments have been starved for a long time. And if you're a constituent, you know that if you waited for a police officer in a non-injury accident on a weekend and you waited three hours, or if you go to codes and you wait all day, or if your kid's going to school in a trailer rather than uh, a school building, um, or you see not enough firefighters, all those things, department after department needs more resources because um, frankly, they were just uh, starved. Um, for growth for too many years as the city grew. So there's a lot of departments that are getting more, uh, more appropriate funding. I'll just mention some of the bigger items. Um, so schools, um, that's the one the mayor leads with. It's been well known that 
for about a decade or so, the school system payroll structure has been out of whack, um, where starting salaries are fairly competitive. And if you're end of your career with um, higher degrees, um, the salaries are pretty competitive. But if you're in the middle years at MNPS um, school system, say seven to 15 years um, into your career, <coughs> the um, the compensation structure is not competitive. You can go multiple years with either getting very little or no increase. And compared to the surrounding counties, it, it's, it's not competitive. So the mayor's planning on investing $81 million more in the school's budget. And most of that goes to fixing this long-term problem of the comp structure for um, teachers. Um, so, and, and think about the Metro budget. It's, $2.6 billion. Schools are about $1 billion of it. That's a, a big 40% chunk of it. Um, so the other side of the house is the main metro government. That's fire police, um, picking up garbage, codes, everything else other than schools. That's the rest. Um, the, the mayor proposes to invest $32 million in improving the pay plan for um, the non-schools employees. Um, and I think, uh, um, you know, one of the annual um, debates that happens um, around the budget is whether increases to the school side are fair compared to increases in salaries on the non-school side. And uh, I guess this is the sixth time I've been through it. And the only thing that's consistent is one side of the house is griping every year. Um, this is gonna be the year where the non-school side of the house is griping. Um, for more than a few years um, of the six I've been in office has been the other way around. And um, at least I, I'm gonna be sensitive to that, of course, um, but I also have uh, sort of this long-term scale of uh, we gotta get it even over time. And so if schools lag behind, we gotta pick it up. Um, let's talk about affordable housing. Um, I think there's something um, uh, for both the public and uh, other council members to keep their eye on here. Um, the mayor's state of Metro talked about putting $30 million into affordable housing this year. If you read this budget up and down, you're not going to find $30 million um, for affordable housing. And the, the mayor um, spoke technically correct words um, at state of Metro. Um, but to drill down on it, the proposal in the budget is to increase the Barnes Fund spending from $10 million to $12.5 million. So that's just two and a half million up. That gap between 12 and a half and the 30 mentioned at um, the state of Metro is to be one time, he, he, he says that he will propose spending from federal relief dollars that we're supposed to get. So um, I know there's some people in the community that have heard 30 million for affordable housing and think that we've uh, we're permanently moving to funding 30 million a year. That's the new bogey that we're going to match every year. And technically speaking, this budget moves it from 10 to 12.5. And then there's going to be one time spending apparently proposed by the mayor's office for the rest of the way up to 30. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. He said the right words at the state of Metro. He was accurate, um, but we need to make sure that people um, aren't, uh, you know, people who are for or against affordable housing don't focus on the 30 like that's the new reality because um, 12 and a half is the new reality. Um, another one that I'm sure is going to drive some conversation is the police department um, budget. Um, last year, we approved a budget of about 210 million. Mayor proposes 226 million for the upcoming budget. Um, again, what I mentioned at the beginning today really isn't the day, the day to get into the pro or con, is that good or bad? I'm just describing what, what's proposed. Um, I'm sure some people will feel like um, their long-term goal is to see uh, resources allocated somewhere else other than um, law enforcement. And, uh, and, and, but that's on one hand and on the other is right now um, it's difficult for police officers to get to the Southeast part of the county because they either have to come from the 12 South precinct or the Hermitage precinct. And um, a, a chunk of the money the mayor proposes is to staff a new precinct out in the southeast sector of the city. Um, and, and again, I think council members are going to hear a lot about um, that balance um, this budget season. Um, the, next, the next batch of uh, 
topics I'll talk about, I lump generally into what I'll call livability, parks, mm -hmm. arts, and transit. Um, the mayor proposes uh, to increase the parks budget about um, just under $4 million from 42 to 46 million. The arts commission budget um, is to increase um, by half million to 3.4, from 3.4 to 3.9 million. Um, you know, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that compared to our peer cities, our um, arts commission budget is, is really a, a sad little fraction of what other cities do. So I'm glad to see that being improved to 3.9 million. Um, then on transit, last year, part of the way we got through COVID was um, transit, we go got a, a, a $25 million, maybe somewhere under 25 million, between 20 and 25 million of federal one-time money. And that gave the city the opportunity to reduce the budget for a year. We were always gonna have to increase that in order to maintain levels of service. And the mayor um, has over last year's budget increased the WeGo budget by $25 million. Uh, most of that is filling in um, for the federal money that we got last year. But there is a, a million dollar um, addition to funding commuter rail. Um, you know, what it's this is very in the weeds on transit, but there, there's there's a technology improvement that the commuter rail line out through Donaldson to Hermitage needs before it can run more frequently under federal law. Um, so we need to invest in that in order to have the sort of frequency that mass transit requires. Um, I'll talk next about uh, economic development. Um, I'm happy that um, it's a small number in the grand scheme of things. It's only $25,000, um, but there's 25,000 being funded for a study that will support um, the council's effort to reform how tax income and financing works. Uh, amazingly, after having used tax income and financing since the mid eighties, nobody has ever, ever, ever even tried to do a study um, to check out whether what all the costs and the benefits are for having tax and financing. Usually the council over the years has been pitched on the benefits of it. Nobody's ever tried to build in what the costs are. And we passed legislation um, in August of 2019 requiring that if tax and financing was gonna continue in Nashville after June of 22, so a year from now, um, we needed to have a study that showed both the the cost and the benefits. Um, so I'm glad to see that's being funded. Uh, a lot of times people ask about the Chamber of Commerce funding, National Area Chamber of Commerce. The mayor cut them back last year during COVID. He proposes to stay um, the same as last year at 175,000. Um, I know that always gets criticism. I personally believe uh, that having the chamber involved in economic development uh, keeps the, the city from having to hire and duplicate the same set of services. So I think there's a value there, probably more than the 175 um, that's in the budget. There's also for two or three years now, the city has um, funded $25,000 a year to a series of smaller chambers of commerce, specialty chambers, um, catering to different minority groups. Um, and the mayor last year proposed to remove that and the council put it back in. The mayor has again proposed to cut it out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we're gonna add it back in uh, again. Uh, I'm not, there's a, it's, only, it's only 100 grand out of a two, two billion. So I haven't had a chance ever to ask why the mayor doesn't like that. Um, but uh, I, think, I think it's popular in the council. I think we'll probably add it back in. And I'll just wrap it up by saying, um, this state stability to sustainability um, should be the theme. It took a number of years to get the city's budget as screwed up as it was before COVID, mm -hmm. which um, uh, the, the sin of the tax rate was not where we put it last year, the 34%, um, because we're still overall compared to peer cities and overall lower tax load, once you add up all the taxes than peer cities, the sin is in the government not having um, the guts, the gumption to um, change the tax rate every several years, every three or four years to make sure that we're ahead on spending and investments rather than getting terribly behind like we did for a number of years. Uh, and so, so this is a good budget, I think, um, but, but we need to have our eye on the prize of, uh, we shouldn't look at the fund balance to say, wow, there's so much money to spend and, and just 
you know, spend it all. We should make sure we're, we've got an eye looking forward for sustainability going forward. And um, I think that was my 25 minutes. So I'll toss it over to you, Zofat. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mendez. Um, you're going to see some lag time as we switch uh, audio because we are in the same room uh, because uh, the governor has issued the order that we cannot uh, do live meeting between council member anymore. So council member Mendez and I are sitting right next to each other. You can see the, 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 the background is the same. Uh, and so because we're in the same room, we have to try to manage the audio so that we're not on at the same time. And so that's where you will get that little lag. Uh, so thank you for, for that. I know there's a couple of questions that are coming in on Facebook. And, but before I get to that, I wanted to ask you, and we're not talking policy, and you're not going to convince me one way or the other. You have what you like, and I have what I like. But I would just wonder, as somebody who's looked at budgets for so many years, and who's been a critique of it for so many years, when looking at this year's budget, uh, what part of it do you like? I know you like the chief part. <laughs> I can almost, <laughs> but in other, in addition to the chief, is there a part of it that you're going, I'm glad we see this. And is there a part of it that you're like, I don't think this is a good idea based on your own opinion? So having stability and hopefully a first step towards sustainability um, gives us more options. You know, what we were seeing, you know, when we started, grabbing $35 million a year from the convention center to make ends meet and doing sort of a fire sale of parking rights to make ends meet. Um, that, that was already after holding back employees on pay and holding back staffing in different departments. And to me, like it's, it's so nice to have a, a budget for a change where we can say, you know, where's, there's room for improvement, especially on savings, and, and we, don't, we don't yet meet the standards that experts have on, on our savings or our fund balance. We're not there yet. We, need, we got more work to do. But you can see across this budget um, investments in, in people, um, uh, both people who live in the community and the people who work hard to provide government services every day. Um, Metro is one of the biggest employers in the city and paying our employees a fair wage helps with affordability in the city, which is a massive issue. Um, and, and so getting teachers and firefighters and everybody uh, who works in the schools, everybody who works across Metro, um, more fair compensation is a big deal for um, helping set wages in the city generally um, and with affordability. So to me, this... Um, this structural thing where we have a tax rate in still low for the area, um, but is, is more appropriately set instead of just ridiculously low set, puts us in a position where we have choices, we have policy discussions about where to invest. And, and frankly, I'm thrilled to death that we're in a position this year to have more policy discussions about where we can allocate resources. Um, and to me, that's the, the best thing about this budget. Thank you. Um, I, I think that a lot of us can relate to that. And I think the mayor himself said that the last year was a crisis budget. This is an investment budget that actually invests in the people. So looking at the budget and, and we see where the mayor is increased funding for so many things. Uh, we talk about affordable housing where it's only 12.5, but he's looking at one-time funding from federal sources to be able to patch the budget or to make it all. My question to you is two, two, two way. The first one is how much of this growth, how much of this increase is organic that we can actually count on for future years? And then the other part of the question is this, if we are using federal funding to make affordable housing better, to do some things in the community, and we know those federal funding are not gonna be here forever, right? And so how do we make sure, is this sustainable? Is that where the fund balance coming? I mean, can you talk to us about that? Because we don't want to all get excited and then in a year, we're back down again. Do you see this growth as something that is sustainable, this investment? All right, we've done the sound swap. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, sound swap. <laughs> uh, we, 
<laughs> good. I got so excited I didn't do the sound as well. Um, so there's a lot there, all good questions. First of all, on the organic growth versus coming out of COVID. Um, so the budget's growing by about $180 million this year. Um, $52.2 um, million of it is from the growth of the city, what, what I think people would call organic growth. The city's bigger, there's more uh, property paying property taxes, there's more tourists paying tourism taxes, there's more people here paying sales tax. Mm -hmm. That equates to $52 million a, a year worth of growth. And then the rest, you know, some 128 million is, is just resetting assumptions that were conservative last year, mm -hmm. like the sales tax assumptions and the tourism tax assumptions were extremely conservative last year because COVID was, you had a lot of stuff shut down and turning the, that mm -hmm. back to normal is the other 128 million worth of growth. So we should look at the 52 okay. as that's that's a real growth number um and and we should not 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 expect that there would be 180 million dollars worth of growth next year for example um and then the other data point i would add uh of my six budgets i've seen the previous high um worth of growth was um i think it was about 110 to 120 million worth of growth um uh in 2015 or 16 when and that was all organic as a city, you know, that's when we first got called the It City and we were booming. Um, so that's the difference between organic and um, the reset and COVID setting. assumptions. The, um, you know, the question about um, is it is it sustainable to say 30 million for affordable housing, but you know that um, 17 and a half of it is coming from one time federal money. The, the answer is, um, I, I go back to that. It took us six, seven years to get to where we were mm. financially, mm. and we will not get out of that spot in mm. one year. Mm. And so this year is a lot better, a lot better. Mm. But I mean, I, I'll be, I mean, I know this makes me Mr. Popularity in some circles, but if, if you were just parachuting in to mm. our finances and trying to figure out where the tax rate should be set, mm. like, we're still, we are still a lower tax load mm. than peer cities. You go to Charlotte, Louisville, Indianapolis, Atlanta, whatever you want to pick as the peer, peer cities, we've got an overall, overall lower tax load. Mm. We're not magic, I don't mm. think. Mm. I don't think we've invented something mm. that we can just do it cheaper. It's coming from somewhere. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. Um, and, and so you have to ask yourself, well, how is it that we have an overall lower tax load? Well, there's something there's something we're still not doing compared to peer cities and and you can make an argument that you know whether it's affordable housing or um getting the, uh, the rest of metro employees comp mm. compensation fixed the right way or 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 we could have a policy conversation that we're still somewhat underfunded compared to peer cities mm. and so we, 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 life's about choices. We've got to make choices somewhere. Mm -hmm. When we roll forward two or three or four years, maybe after I'm term limited, mm -hmm. maybe before, um, in, hopefully we don't wait eight or 10 years to raise the tax rate. Hopefully we get our cost structure dialed in with what we need to do. And then we can invest in everything we want to instead of a lot or most of what we want to. And when is that? I'm going to start going to some of the, and they may not hear me because we're still switching. Uh, volume here, but we're going to now go to some of the questions online. Um, and I think there are some that I want to wait till the end. I'm going to go back into that, but somebody did ask about the MMPS budget. And let me say this to the viewing audience. The co budget conversation will be every week, same time from now on. Next week, we'll be talking about the reappraisal as well as the uh, referendum. The week after that, we're looking at MMPS budget in detail, and we're going to look at the law enforcement in details. So we will address some of your questions in detail at those sessions, but we just want to give an overview so we know what is in this year's budget as much as possible. Uh, but the question from Brian is that he wanted to know when the mayor said he fully funded MMPS, did that mean that we know that there's an 81 million increase? Yes. But was the 1.1 million what MMPS asked for? Did, did we for the, the, the mayor's budget basically accept everything that was in MMPS budget? And I think he was very That's much interested in that question. question. Yeah. Uh, 
So I think fully funded MNPS is could be interpreted a couple different ways. Um, I think the way the mayor meant it um, was that he his budget proposes the amount that the school board asked for. Um, I think you know fully funding schools actually. I think that's a. Uh, I mean, you only got to take a walk around, um, you know, random school of your choice and see that um, this year's budget isn't going to isn't going to make the schools work as well as they could be and be the best they can be. I think there's more road to cover. Um, so I, I think he just meant um, that he fulfilled the request that um, the schools asked for. Now, you know, it's sort of a poorly kept secret that different mayors do this different ways. Mm -hmm. A lot of times mayors in the past have broadcast to their department heads, you better ask for X because that's all you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And then the mayor looks like he or she mm -hmm. is, you know, providing the full request, uh, but they, they sort of pre-baked what the request is. Here, I think, um, I don't know exactly how it worked between the, the school board um, uh, Dr. Battle and the mayor, um, but they they had a pretty big ask and for this year, and, and the mayor is proposing that we fill it. Thank you. There is a question on the referendum, but I wanted to leave that till the end, if possible. Uh, so I want to go to this question about, um, and this is just coming from you, and I believe you've mentioned some of them, what you think the council might do. Uh, uh, without us going into any policy conversation or, or, or discussing anything in detail, uh, Miriam wanted to know what amendments to the mayor's budget do you personally anticipate? I don't know if that is off topic. I don't want to take to get us in any trouble uh, uh, because, because we still want to make sure we, we're within the laws. <laughs> so if we can, anything that you can say, so if you cannot, we we'll leave it to the floor. Well, to start, um, I, I, um, I saw that you did a um, valid public meeting notice of this, so we did. So we can we can we can talk about it. Um, you know, right now, um, I've only got a couple things on my mind. I, I've for three years I've been in the trenches um, trying to. I mean, I, everybody knows. I guess I, I ran on getting the property tax increase raised. I, I fought for it for a number of years to get the city properly funded or better funded, at least. Um, and 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 so now we're living in in a year where that fight isn't to be had. And and so part of me feels like, I mean, I don't I don't want to take the budget season off. I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> I'm going to spend a lot less hours on it because there's not a property tax rate fight here. Um, so. I mean, one thing on my mind that does relate to the referendum is the election commission might get their budget card back because um, if they're going to be a rogue agency um, uh, looking to destroy Metro, damage Metro, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure whether it's this operating budget or when they come for um, a supplemental appropriation to pay their legal fees for their couple of law firms. Um, you know, so that's on my mind is um, whether the election commission is going to get all the money proposed in their budget and how I feel about that. Um, the uh, beyond that, um, I think I'm going to pay attention to what the public says mm -hmm. about police. I think there's going to be different points of view about that. Um, the main thing that I'm prepped for is um, I will aggressively work to defend the fund balance that's in the budget um, from <laughs> sticky fingers um, trying, to, <laughs> trying to grab it. Um, the, I mean, there were two things I, I didn't get when I was budgeting finance committee chair last year. There were two things that I didn't get what I wanted on. Um, and and I, obviously, I respect the, the, the majority of the council. But one of them was um, I was reducing the police department's budget by I think $2.7 million. And there was an amendment um, by another council member to put that back in. And then, and then you made the argument that um, the fund balance, while I think we all agreed it was dangerously low, um, you, you thought that it, it, we could tolerate um, uh, giving some more money to MNPS. As it turned out, 
you were right. Um, we did tolerate it. Um, but I still feel strongly that we can't, and I think you agree with this, um, we can't be in the habit of grabbing the fund balance when it's still at a place that, that really isn't safe. Now we're going into good times again, hopefully economically good times nationally, not for every individual, but nationally. The city should stockpile money. Um, you know, if we had been average going into COVID, we would have had a fund balance mm -hmm. Average for 25 biggest cities, we would have had a fund balance of $800 million. And instead, we had $50 million. And if we would have had $800 million, we would not have had to tag the citizens for the big property tax increase. So to me, we, you, you um, stash seed corn during good times. And in this context, seed corn is a fund balance. And, and so while times are good, we should run the fund balance up to 400, 500, 600 million dollars. So if we had bad times, we don't have to fire employees um, or raise taxes. That's the thing I plan on defending the most in this budget. All right. Um, I'm now trying to do the volume. <laughs> I think we're getting we're getting good at this. <laughs> We're getting this at this at this uh, switching back and forth. Uh, all right. Um, so I, I do agree with you. Last year, I was very passionate about taking from fund balance to to help with the MNPS budget because I thought we were in a crisis. And I come from the uh, assumption that you know, for all of us, when you are in a crisis, is not when you save. I don't know, unless you have so much money on the side. So you have to deal with the issue at hand before you go into saving. I'm glad that this budget is one of investment. I do agree, especially since we have one-time funding. We know federal funding is not going to continue forever. We have to make sure that we don't dip into our fund balance and spend it all. Because when we lose those uh, sp spending, uh, what do we do? The other thing that people also have to bear in mind is that federal dollars is on a reimbursement basis, which means that you have to spend it first before they give you the money. So if you don't have money in your fund balance to spend, you really cannot even go after the federal dollar to be reimbursed for it. And I think that's a conversation that I'm willing to have this year compared to last year when we were in crisis. I did not want to hear it last year, but this year I think I'm more receptive to it. All right, so we're looking at more questions online. Um, somebody asked and said, what is the financial implication to repeal of the property tax increase to the 2022 budget? Again, we have a big conversation next week, but I know that you've thought about it. Um, so the referendum um, that's, uh, that is pending, that is set for election on July, on July 27th at this point, unless a, a court um, interferes with it, um, will do two things. Um, one, if it's legal in the short term um, for the upcoming fiscal year, it would take $40 million out of our budget. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's, that would be bad because almost certainly that would mean take away the teacher's pay raise. Mm. Um, because that, when, when you look at $40 million with what's proposed in the new budget, that that's the only thing that gets rid of $40 million in one fell swoop anything else you start go cutting multiple departments and so if it passed if it's legal if it applies to the current the the fiscal year that starts on july 1 um, i think the teacher salaries um, are the most obvious thing to go away maybe we'd make a policy decision to um, do cut a bunch of departments a little bit rather than do that um, uh, the the new precinct um, for the police department and antioch has got a pretty decent price tag on it. So that's a pretty attractive target for cutting. Um, so I, I do think police and schools are what gets hit if that thing passes and it's legal and it applies to the current fiscal year. Um, but that's just one of the issues. The, the bigger issue is that on a go forward basis, it will require a public referendum um, to raise the tax rate by more than 3%. And if you look at the 58 year history of Metro, Every, I don't know if it's every, almost every tax rate increase that's ever been has been more than 3%. Mm -hmm. 
three three percent is not that much. And the, we don't we we've made a policy decision a long time ago. We don't want to change the tax rate every, every single, single year. Where every single year, people got to change their escrows mm -hmm. and pay different amounts. Before 2005, when we got stupid on tax rate, um, we were changing every three or four years. Mm -hmm. And and that was a cycle that makes sense. I, I hope we get back to that mm -hmm. cycle. Um, but if, if we're on a every three or four year cycle, mm -hmm. every one will be more than 3%, which means every tax rate will have a referendum. And that's, that's a horrible way to run a railroad. And if you look in California, who's had things like that on their property tax rate, mm -hmm. Governments get chronically underfunded. Mm. It comes out of schools um, more than anything else. Mm. If you look to California, and so it's it's exceedingly dangerous. You know, you got uh, twelve thousand people signed a petition out of seven hundred thousand people in the county, funded by people that won't identify themselves. Um, they're they're not here to improve Metro, and it would damage Metro if that thing passed. Immediate, short term, we have to get rid of forty million bucks. Um, teachers and cops are probably the first place to go. Mm -hmm. Does it have an impact on this budget? I thought I got it, Bob. So, so the question that I have is that the election is taking place after June thirtieth, after we've already passed this year's taxes. So, what impact does it have, if any, on FY twenty two budget? Um, so it's a good question. I think courts are going to decide that. Um, let me say, it. I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> I was president of the National Bar Association. I like lawyers generally. Mm -hmm. you, sorry. Um, there's two lawyers in this county I can't stand. One of them is Jim Roberts, the guy behind this petition. Um, it, Jim, his argument is that up until the tax bills go out in October, mm -hmm. Metro has the legal authority to change the budget. We talked Ooh, some about that last year. year. But I personally haven't done any research, just got feeling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think Metro Legal will argue that just because Metro has the hypothetical authority to change a budget up until when the tax bills go out, that doesn't mean the referendum can um, overrule a lawfully passed bill, the budget. Mm -hmm. So we will have a lawfully passed budget somewhere around the middle of June. Um, and um, and, and I, I question whether the referendum um, will impact this fiscal year. That's why I say, if it passes, if it's legal, and if it applies mm -hmm. to this year. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't, then we'll just have to get rid of 40 million the next year and the raises, you know, would have been one year worth of raises mm -hmm. for teachers not going forward. Or we'd have to find somewhere else to get rid of $40 million worth of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Changing thing again. All right. Um, I wanted to thank all the other council people that are online. Uh, council member Hurd has some comment in there from our council member Bedney is on and a whole bunch of you and I see a lot of our colleagues on. Thank you all for joining. If you have questions, I'm still looking. Um, I may be missing, uh, but I don't see any. I think I, you all are just interested in the conversation. That's good enough. I would be remiss if I don't echo what council member Mendez said about the referendum. Uh, I think that we have to uh, make sure that we're letting people know that this does not make any sense at all. And I think the people that are pushing this are playing on people's fear. They're playing on what happened last year. And last year was a crisis. And last year, he said it a number of times, we, we did not raise taxes for eight years. And it was a buildup that got us in the hole. We were threatened by the controller. There was just so much going on. Uh, that was not the way to govern. And it was, it was a crisis mode. We're not in crisis anymore. We're now where we can invest in our community. We're now where we can actually fully fund schools and, and put more money in banks. 2.5, 10.5 is still something that we're doing. And I think that people should uh, put that out there that I hope it never goes, gets to vote. If it does, that we do vote it down as a citizen and we keep talking about it. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Jason Freeman, uh, with SEIU and Jason is going to take more of your question on the referendum and talk some more about it. If you have question at that time, feel free to uh, send it to me or just come online again to discuss it. 
Uh, we we'll also have the assess of property next week. I think it's very important that, you know, we're getting, people are getting the assessment and because of growth, uh, a lot of people think that this is the council doing this. It's not the council, it's the market. Uh, uh, the more market value goes up in some area, the higher the assessment. Uh, and even though the tax rate we're considering is lower, for some people, they may end up paying more property taxes. So it's important for people to know that they can uh, ask for an appeal of that assessment. And I believe that you need to contact the assessor of property office today, not today, they're close today, on Monday, uh, and talk to them about the appeal process. I think there's a deadline for the informal appeal next Friday, which will be before our conversation with Assessor Willard, but I want you to, to be mindful of that date next Friday is the deadline for the informal appeal. Then the appeal process continues after that, and then she will be here Saturday to talk more about what is the next step and to answer any question that, that you may have. Um, I'm going to look again and see, uh, Council Member Hurt was just talking about we need transparency and we need to make sure that households are non for profit and small businesses that were hurt the most uh, that they receive the fair share. So as we're looking at this budget, we need to make sure that it's a budget that works for, for everyone. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to a bunch of things in my wish list uh, that I did not see in the mayor's budget, but I hope that I will see in the in the chair sub. Um, again, if you have any question, we have about eight minutes. Uh, if you want to throw it in there, I'm, I want to make sure that I cover it. Uh, when I'm waiting for people to, to ask any other question, I think an area that I found interesting, and I think you did talk about this, and I don't think we can talk about it enough, is on the debt service. I mean, our debt service is about 30%, and people always talk about naturally so much in debt. But you and I appreciate what we saw this year about the refinancing of those debt that, that actually save us money. And so when people are seeing us passing ordinances like we did the last meeting relating to debt service, debt service, I think it's good for people to understand what those we're doing as we talk about this budget. Can you just uh, say a little about that if you don't mind, please? Yeah, I think, I think that's really important. Um, the reason why the percentage was going up um, over about five years before now was not because the city was spending too much. It was because of the, again, this property tax thing where we'd stagnated on revenue. Um, you know, some of the, some of the finance director's presentation, he had a, um, a, a graph. It was, it was kind of dense, but it, it had one line that showed pro, uh, uh, population growth and another line that showed um, size of the budget. And there were a couple of years where the size of the budget was lagging behind wow. the population oh, growth. Wow. And, and that's, that's the <laughs> failure to have political will to have the property tax rate right sized mm -hmm. for a growing city and letting it stagnate for so many years. You know, if anybody who lives here knows there's a bunch of debt, a bunch of spending the city should do. Mm -hmm. Anybody who lives outside the 440 loop um, has got three or four intersections that they hate. Um, and especially as you get to the edges of the county, the formerly rural roads that are now suburban, you know, where you, you know, live in, in Councilman Bradford's district, mm -hmm. and it takes you a half hour to get out of your neighborhood to get on the interstate at Donaldson Pike. Um, and you go out to uh, Una Antioch Pike, mm -hmm. you know, Blue Hole Road, you know, that, yeah. that tangle of roads out in Antioch. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's more. I mean, everybody knows yeah. where they are. And, um, and that, that's a lot of spending to fix those formerly rural roads into working right. Um, the schools, just, just the deferred maintenance line item, not building new buildings, just the deferred maintenance, stuff that they could do to fix air conditioners and mm -hmm. roofs and, and walls mm -hmm. and leaks. Um, it's like $300 million, $400 million worth of deferred maintenance. There's plenty of things that the city could spend on. And when we talked about there's no, you don't get not anything for free and we're underfunded compared to peer cities, well, there you have it. You know, if we had a higher, if we chose to have a higher tax structure overall, then we wouldn't have to slow walk horrible intersections and school maintenance. Now, collectively as a city, 
like we've probably pushed the tax rate as high as we can push the tax rate for right now. Mm -hmm. But that means we collectively, all 700,000 of us made the choice to have crappy intersections and that don't get improved quickly mm -hmm. and schools with deferred maintenance. And so it's not, it's not a debt problem. It's a choice mm -hmm. as a city to set our tax um, burden at a particular place and then we pay what we can pay for. Um, while you wait, I'm going to talk about that referendum for a second. Um, one of the things that people really need to take a hard look at, um, the, the top line on that petition that people signed said roll back 34% tax increase it didn't say tax rate mm -hmm. that is misleading mm -hmm. if it passes and if it's legal after the reappraisal people's taxes are going to go down by about 3.7 percent mm -hmm. so if you pay a thousand thirty dollars your taxes are going to go down to a thousand dollars and and that's it um, and so it's it's grossly misleading um, I suspect that the dark money that won't identify itself mm -hmm. isn't in it for the rate increase. Mm -hmm. They they put the the property tax rate on there because everybody loves lower mm -hmm. taxes. Mm -hmm. They're in it for the other more damaging things, or mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. more damaging mm -hmm. things are making it incredibly mm -hmm. easy for very small groups to get rid of elected officials they don't like mm -hmm. and to cause near constant referendums mm -hmm. on transferring real estate. You know, we, we passed, uh, we, we did a approved a lease for a little part of Rose Park mm -hmm. for MNPS that would have required a referendum. Um, you know, there, the customs house down, downtown is leased. Um, it's where the bankruptcy court is. Mm -hmm. To approve that lease a couple of years ago would have required a referendum. Mm -hmm. we, there, the, the, the triggering events in there for a referendum and um, making it easier to disrupt metro government. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And the taxes were put on there as a misleading, bright, shiny object for wow. people to look at. If you vote for it, if it passes, if it's legal, your taxes will go down about 3.7%. But the damage from the other provisions will be um, brutal mm -hmm. to the metro government. Uh -huh. Thank you, Trustee. Thank you for speaking to that. And, and I think one part of it that oh, that I do not understand is for, for calling for or, or, or on the referendum, asking for uh, votes all the time, if it is about money, if it's about saving the people and making sure we have money to invest in our community, having an election all the time is not the way to go. Because every time we do that, it costs us money. And so even the old idea, the premise does not even does not even make any sense. I know that we went through a lot last year and I know that a lot of people were hurting and I know that having that property tax increase was at a point where a lot of people were not expecting it. I can say that it hurts a lot of us to even do it, but we were at a point when we had no choice. It was bad decision after bad decision. And I think you want the elected officials that are bold enough to do what they believe is right to be able to take care of the citizens. I told someone that since I've been elected to council, uh, I finally, after the mayor's metro address, felt like I could I could actually exhale uh, because it's been trauma after trauma financially, not on the just as a whole, uh, uh, COVID, everything that we've had to deal with, the tornado and everything. And I'm so excited that we do now have a conversation where in making that hard decision, uh, 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 taking that bitter pill last year. We now have a budget where we can now actually invest in the people where we're talking about how much more and adding so much more. And I think that's where we want to be. That's the conversation we want to continue to have. I'm going to say that uh, we'll continue this budget conversation next week. Uh, uh, it will be every week for the next seven or eight weeks until the budget is passed. Uh, the idea is for you to tune in, give your thoughts. We want you to be involved in the decision that is being made. We're listening so that we can take your thoughts and your questions uh, and your ideas as we deliberate to make the policy changes and to make the votes. That's the essence of it. So I hope you will plan to join me again next week uh, with uh, Assessor of Property, Vivian Will Oyt and Mr. Jason Freeman. I wanted to thank Council Member Mendes. Mendes. Uh, like I said, he's an expert on this. I'm glad that he was able to join us today. Any last word uh, before we close it out? Just uh, thank you for doing these. I mean, last year, 
especially during COVID. Um, it, it was remarkable that you were able to put this to, together because um, it, it, it just reached so many people um, and the fact that you're recording them so they're available. Um, so just thanks, I'm glad you're doing this. Thank you. Oh, the good thing is next week, I'm not talking to a council member, so we will all be on Zoom and we will not have to do the toggle back and forth, but I, I appreciate all your patience. I appreciate council member Mendes. I appreciate all of you for tuning in. Uh, go to the link to find the budget, share the video, talk about it, and then let's keep the conversation going. Thank you all so much and you all have a nice weekend. Thanks. <laughs>